Today we continue our series on questions. I think many people expect churches to come with answers, but we begin with questions. And it's interesting to me that the Bible, Jesus loves an authentic question. And this is a question that was submitted to us. And it really under has a points to, if you will, the question of can we really trust the Bible? The question is some of the early characters of the Old Testament are said to live several centuries. Do we know why this is? Or is there an explanation for it? Who trusts the Bible? Who does an explanation? The reality is that the Bible comes out of oral tradition. Did you know, for example, that Adam, according to the Bible, lived 930 years? We read that, yeah, we read that and we begin to wonder, um, how did that happen? Well, there are a couple of ways to get at this. Let me do this. How many of you have had that experiment where you whisper something to somebody and then they whisper, it goes around the room, and what happens? By the time it goes from there, it goes to here, and what happens? Yeah. At the end, you can't hardly understand what it's actually beginning, right? Well, the problem with that is that we are a liquid culture, and the Bible comes out of an auditory or an oral culture. See, the reason we don't remember that is because our brains are wired to read. And their brains were wired to hear. And in the hearing, they were able then to pass it on. But there came a point when the hearing of the stories need to be written down. When that happened, they were so careful about writing the stories as they knew them because it was hope. And they couldn't play willy-nilly with it. So if the Bible said that Adam lived 930 years, they may not have known what to do with that, but they wrote it down. So one of the things we've learned is that in fact, the Bible has been transmitted with great faith careful from not only the oral tradition, but then it's passed on and copied from one text to another text to another text. Well, what about, if you go to the next one, what about the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis? Careful reading will show that the first 11 chapters, beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden, the creation, the garden, etc., is prehistory. When you get to the 12th chapter, Suddenly things change. We hear about real people in real places, not that Adam and Eve were real or the others, Noah, but real people, real places, real timeline. Oh, the story oh, of in fact, Abraham and the of God. So what we know, since it was prehistory, we know, for example, that they didn't count 24 hour days. How many of you knew that? They didn't have 24 hour days. They lived from sun up to sun down. We also know that they didn't have a Victorian calendar, which is to say they didn't have years of 365 days. So we really don't know what the age meant. We came to the point of saying we can trust the Bible because what the Bible is talking about, even in the first seven chapters of Genesis, is about the God that we can know. In Jesus Christ. I don't buy it. I know you have an opinion. <laughs> so, what you're saying is that there are some parts then that, um, I should turn the microphone on before. Um, there's some parts that we just have to kind of explain away. But then, if we have to just kind of explain them away, oh, there weren't 24 hour days, or there weren't exactly 12 month years, how in the world could we trust? Those things, we can say whether they're not factually accurate, but the rest of it is something that we can trust. I don't, I don't, I don't buy it. Well, my guess is that some of you don't buy it. That just doesn't make sense. Well, but the truth is that we are not dismissing it away. What we're saying is we don't quite understand it. How many of you are aware that the Bible has mystery? There's some things we read, and we can't automatically grasp it doesn't mean it's not true it just means it's a mystery so what's the purpose of the bible 
All right. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Isn't it interesting? Paul doesn't say all scripture is inspired by God is useful for a scientific lab book. Does not mean there isn't science in the Bible. It means that the purpose of the Bible is different. It's to point to the God we know in Jesus Christ. And you can bank on that. So, a little bit like this kid's time, we would be excited about finding the destination. We're not worshiping the hero, but we're thinking about what the hero points what does the arrow of the scripture point us to? So, so it points to God, the God that we know. How many of you have found that the longer you believe and the closer you are to God, the more the Bible is true? The more it speaks to life as it really is. That's the point of it. But you and I know that sometimes the Bible is used by people for other reasons. Some of you perhaps, um, Apple TV has a new, the new Will Smith movie. It's um, uh, uh, Emancipation. It's about slaves in Louisiana. Right at the end of the Civil War, uh, Emancipation Proclamation has already been issued, and so they are technically free, except that the South doesn't recognize that. And so Will Smith plays a character, a uh, black woman slave. He was taken from his family, treated horribly, right? uh, put in shackles and chains, and he is marched into a slave camp, doing some sort of work, treated horribly, spoken to ridiculously, uh, painfully, and one of the opening scenes of that movie is a preacher standing in a box in the middle of this slave camp, slaving to be obedient. How can we, how could we wrestle with that? Because in some sense, the Bible does. The, the Bible does not have a problem with it. How do we, as people of God, how do we as faithful Lutheran Christians, how do we approach Scripture? We know that Scripture points us to Jesus. We love the gospel. We read from them often as your pastors. We read them up from them often as, uh, as congregation. In the middle of the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus speaking to his disciples. And he says this. A thief comes to kill and to, uh, to steal and to kill and to destroy. But then Jesus says, I've come that you, I've come that my disciples, I've come that you followers of me, that you would have life and have it abundantly. That means that as scripture points us to Jesus, Jesus points us to fullness of life. Now, I have to admit that fullness of life is not necessarily a full calendar, because those of you who have a full calendar you know that that's less than a full life, right? But an abundance of life means that we're set free by the promise of the gospel. We are forgiven of our sins and that we live in a different way. We're eager to serve our neighbor. We're eager to build those up who are torn down. And so scripture points us to the promise of Jesus and that, that we have been given the promise of abundant life. And in fact, over the last 30 to 40 years, all of the sociological psychological studies have shown that the closer people get to God, that is, as we practice our faith, we're happier and healthier, and statistically, we live longer. Which takes us back to the question we don't know what all those years may have been or how they timed it. What we do know is that when you read the scripture, you'll find the closer to Eden they are, the longer they live. The further away from Eden and from the presence of God that they move, the shorter their lifespan. So it's a theological statement about when we're close to God, life is abundant. 
So then Genesis and the two creation poems of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are not meant to be then a textbook of how the world begins. No, what we do know from the Big Bang theory and theory of evolution is that the first creation account follows in sequence very, very close, but it wasn't the last one which moves to be The question I'd ask is, in the garden of Eden, who is around taking notes? They learned though, and they told the stories, and the stories were holy, so when it came to writing them down, they were very careful. Not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, the life of Jesus. Say that again. In the Garden of Eden, who was taking notes? You asked that question to me earlier this week, and I have so many questions. <laughs> Who was taking notes in the Garden of Eden? There are, in scripture, a whole lot of different literary tools, a whole lot of different literary styles. There's there's poems, there's metaphors, there's history, there's teaching, there's allegory, there's miracles, there's all kinds of different ways in which the power and the truth of scripture is shared with those who love it and read it. Very quickly, poems. There's lots of different poems in scripture, particularly these six books in the uh, in the Old Testament. Some of you know this poem very well. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. And how many of you as I just been saying those words, you're hearing the song in your mind, right? Because it's poetry, right? There's lots of poetry in scripture. There's lots of metaphor in scripture. Jesus says, I am the bread of life in John chapter 16. And not even 20 verses later, the Jews then disputed among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Like, I don't know, right? There's metaphor in scripture. There's history. In those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be rich. Right? We have at least 53 different characters in the or are people who are referenced in the Old Testament who are real historical characters, right? There's history told to us in, um, in Scripture. There's instruction. Peter came to Jesus. How many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Seven times? Jesus instructs and said, not seven, but 77 times. And so very quickly, we're like, okay, well, I'm going to keep the tally then up to 77, but that's not the key. The point is to keep on forgiving, not to keep it up to seven or 77. There's, there's allegory, sorry, the God of Son, and there's miracles. So Jesus changed water into wine at the feast. So, Exodus. Lutheran Christians were not biblical literates. We're not. We are people who take the metaphors, metaphorically, the allegory, allegorically, <laughs> the poems, we read them as poems. I mean, we teach the instructions as instructions to us. But we're not, I mean, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to see, what are you supposed to do with this? What are you supposed to do with this? Fuck it up. As far as I can tell, most of you have both eyes. So we're not biblical literates. We talked about miracles earlier. You shared a story with me about a miracle that you experienced from a witness. Did you share that with us? Yes. Yeah. I hope that you can see that both Nate and I take scripture very seriously. We believe it to be with God and we have great confidence in it. Um, we have what's called a high view of scripture. Um, when it comes to miracles, of course, we believe in miracles. Uh, but I had experienced a number of years ago where a, uh, uh, a woman, a young mother, I think with two or three children, I can't recall which, uh, called me. She asked for an appointment, and um, I recognized the name, and I had seen her and her husband and the kids, and she said the appointment came in, and uh, I welcomed her in, closed the door in the office, and she immediately began to. And I waited, and finally I said, you want to talk about that? And she said, that's why I'm here. She said, I was just diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I'm sorry. <coughs> I said, how do you know it's multiple sclerosis? She said, I went to the doctor, took an MRI, and there were lesions on my brain. Which at that time were 
pre diagnostic uh, evidence for the world. And she said, So I've come to ask you, please pray for me and pray for you. I said, Okay. She was obviously upset, as any one of us would be. I did some prayers of relaxation and some energy prayers. And at the end of the book, with the Lord's Prayer, and uh, she was grateful. She said, So I can pack back to the court. She came back a couple of days later. We did the same kinds of prayers. Nation imaging close with the Lord's Prayer. And then she came back a third time that week, and we prayed the same thing. We're going to pray the same thing. She said, Pastor Mike, I shouldn't be coming to you every, every day or every other day. Why don't you just tape it? And I'll take it home and I'll be able to follow along and do it myself. How many of you remember cassettes? <laughs> and uh, I said, Okay, I put that out. We recorded the prayer session. Gave her the set, she went home. Um, I checked on her that coming week and she said, Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it, it's wonderful. Um, I didn't hear from her. And then a couple of months later, I got a call out of the group and she was excited. She said, Pastor Mike, I've been healed. Like you, I was a bit skeptical. I said, So, uh, what does that mean? She said, I went to the doctor. Did an MRI and the lesions on my brain are gone. And the doctor said it had to be a miracle. Asked me what I've been doing different. I said, I've been praying. He said, Well, it's a miracle. So I've had an experience, as many of you have, of um, experiencing the miracles that I've had. But that's the one I remember that was medically confirmed <coughs> by tests. No symptoms, no lesions. Now, you told that story to me, I think, on Tuesday. And my first response to you was I believe in miracles. How, how many of you do you believe in miracles? Yeah? And, and as soon as you told that first thing, I don't know that I can like, concretely put my, my finger on a miracle that I've experienced myself. I think it's absolutely sad. I, I believe in that. I, I think it's powerful. But like I, I, I started calling the question, like, should, I, should I even be a pastor? Because I have, you know, right? Well, what do we do with it? Well, the truth is, Miracles, by definition, are rare. I'm going to say that again. Miracles, by definition, are rare. But for 40 some years in ministry, that's the miracle that I really look at for the concerns. Mm -hmm. The great apologist C.S. Lewis wrote Nothing can seem extraordinary until you have discovered what is ordinary. You know what's extraordinary, you know what's ordinary. Belief in miracles, far from depending on and ignorance of the laws of nature, is only possible insofar as those laws are known. Let me give you an example. Dr. Lisa Miller, in her work, uh, The Awakened Brain, neuroscientist, a PhD at Columbia University, science an experiment where they had two groups, opposite ends of the building. They weren't aware of one another. One group was a group to pray for people they had names with uh, and, and would talk about the condition. Way on the other side were people, all I knew is that they were going to be praying. As they prayed, what they found was the heartbeat of the one praying for the one who was being prayed for, those heartbeats synced up and they beat in sequence with one another. Uh, Dr. Miller. Moves on to talk about quantum physics, which I'd love to talk about, but this is not the time of the science rod, so I'll just back up. <laughs> we don't know necessarily what's working. So then it brings this question who, who do we trust? What do we trust? So we look at scripture. Scripture is the thing that points us. To Jesus. We hear in that prologue to the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father, from which comes called grace and truth. The Word became flesh, Jesus. 
So it kind of remind the will of God. It came to demonstrate God's action in the world here and now. The word became flesh. I was given this um, this Bible in 1983. Got a placard on it. It was presented to Nathan Lipke at the college in elementary school on a handwriting I wrote it myself. And it was presented to me by my dad. <laughs> uh, because my dad is my pastor at Gloria Day, at Gloria Day Lutheran Church in Cornwall, Wisconsin. And um, elementary school kids were invited to come forward one Sunday, just like we will do next Sunday for our kindergarten students and our third grade students. We'll invite them forward and we'll place into those child's hands the scripture. I was given this Bible in 1983, and, and right after church, we went downstairs to one of the classrooms, and one of the, uh, one of the Sunday school teachers, she was going to teach us all about the Bible in 45 minutes. We'll do the same thing um, with, 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 with our kids that we present Bibles to. But I remember uh, after, you know, it's kind of a dress up day, you know, like a big day, like you call the front church and give this Bible, and it's like, right? And you hold it just a little bit differently, you know, you walk just a little bit differently, right? You know, it's a gift that's been given to you. And uh, one of the kids walked into class, I think they've set their Bible down on the table, and they sent one and sat and they said, Oh, hand me my Bible. And one of the other kids that had just gotten their Bible, they picked up his Bible and they kind of tossed it to me. Right? Kind of tossed it to me over the straight going, It was a terrible toss and it fell on the floor. His table fell on the floor. And you know, the whole class are like, Now, as I tell that story, I want you to know that I revere, study, and love scripture. And I don't worship this book. I worship what this book points me to, which is Jesus. I love this Bible. Some of you have Bibles that are much older than 1983. But, um, some of us have Bibles that are much older than that. But we don't worship the book, we worship what the book points us to. You have a special Bible to tell us about. Before my father died, he showed me an old Bible. This was uh, printed in the uh, late 1800s. And he said it was his grandfather's Bible. Apparently, my great grandfather was a, what in the Norwegian called a Goer Press, which is he was a preacher who preached the food. He'd go visit churches and do services. And uh, it was a mess. Apart and left in the attic uh, that my father cleaned out from my grandma. And uh, he talked about it. I said, Well, Dad, I, I can get this rebound. I took it to the monastery seminary where I was doing graduate work, and the monks put it together. And th this is the book that has my great grandfather's name on it, L.K. Anderson, and then my father's, J.A. Vaughn. And I treasure this. I received it after Dad died because it reminds me of the faith that I've received. And someday, I hope when I'm dead and gone, we'll have my name. And one of my daughters or my grandchildren the treasure of this book. Not because of the book, but because of the faith. You know, Luther talked about, talk about this. The Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is born. So if you hold the Bible open, Jesus is laid inside these scriptures. And that's what this book points us to. The Bible is the place where the Christ is revealed to each one. It's interesting that the more we can read the Bible, the more we learn about the God made known to Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you to take time to read the scripture and come to know this God who creates and sustains all that he is and promises a life beyond this, which you're going to talk about next week. Right? What are you talking about right after this? Yep. Uh, Lou and Tom, would you read this quote with me? I think it's a great one. Has written, Be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible some person ever reads. Now, before you start feeling guilty about that, the word perfect is not. God doesn't need perfect Christians. God needs real Christians. Let your life be witness to a faith 
It is personal. Thank you very much. Gracious God, thank you for the opportunity to get together and feel, think about this remarkable gift you've given us in the Bible. Help us to grow in our understanding and our use of it. And we ask this in the name of the living Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Bridget Sandler, sing a song of response. Amen.